Good day, grade 11. Welcome to this next lesson in mathematics. I'm sorry, there's been a bit of a typo and it was totally my fault. Um, we are not doing probability today, we're doing statistics. And um, we actually finished going through probability in the last lesson, which is why I think I just said um, probability, but it's actually statistics. So I'm sorry about that. And we're carrying on with statistics. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about histograms and we're just going to carry on going through statistics and um, different parts of statistics. So first of all, what is a histogram? It's basically a graphical way or visual way to represent data and how data is spread. There is a big difference between, well, there's the main difference between histograms, well, there are two main differences, sorry. There are two main differences between histograms and bar graphs. The most obvious one is a histogram doesn't have spaces between them, whereas a bar graph does. But the reason for that is important. Um, the histogram compares information that's of a similar type. So this is looking at number of students and scores on final exams. So this would be the same type of data that is being compared, whereas a bar graph is looking at different types of data. So it could be um, different appliances being sold and the rate at which they sold at. So then the bar graph might have a column for, um, I was about to say tomatoes when I would already said appliances. So to be the bar graph would be for toasters, ovens, microwaves, etc, etc. So we'd be comparing different things, even though we're looking at the how much it's been sold, you're comparing different things. That's a bar graph. A histogram is comparing data of the same nature. Um, it's usually used to display group data. So you'll notice here it's from 0 to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80, and 80 to, per, to 100. Okay, right. Um, and like I said, there are no spaces between the bars. So let's look at an example. Um, if this is a frequency distribution of the height of 25 students ranging from 54 inches through to 74 inches. Um, so the first question they're asking is how many students have a height of between 70 and 72? Sorry, if you've got the printout of this, it's a little bit easier to see, but if it's on the screen, it's a little bit um, small. Um, but from here, it's zero through to six. Um, and every one of these goes up in two. So the 70 to 72 inch range is this one. And if you read off there, there are two students that have a height between 70 and 72. Then it says which height or group of heights has the smallest frequency. Um, I would say the ones that have got zero <laughs> would have the smallest frequency. So that would be the 54 to 56 and 56 to 58. So in other words, nobody is that short within the height distribution. If they mean somebody with an actual frequency, then you're looking at this one, which is the 72 to 74 inches. Right, now we need to look at how to plot a histogram. So the first thing that we need to do is learn to draw a stem and leaf. Okay, so the way the stem and leaf works is like this. Okay, so this is got all the numbers are digit, double digits. So the, in other words, what we'll do is we'll write then um, one, whoopsie, sorry, hang on. Let me just correct this, uh, erase all ink. Let's make it nice and neat. Um, one, Oh, jeez, I'm so sorry. Let me try once more. Um, and then otherwise, I'm just not going to draw lines. One. Okay, that's terrible. Two. That's a bit better. Three. Four. Five. Six. I wonder how all these people are. Seven. Eight. Are they only 90 year old. I don't think so. Okay, that's enough. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to draw a stem and leaf diagram for the people, okay? But what we do is we, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, represent the first number of the two digit, two -digit number. So in other words, everything in the 10 column will be, um, in this column will be 10, 11, 12, 13, all to 19. This is 23 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, 50 to 59. Okay, and then what you do is you fill in the, the secondary number, in other words, the units number in the leaf section. So, for example, yeah, we've got 30, so that's going to be a zero, comma, oh, zero. 
Then there's 14, so that is a 4, comma, 21. Okay, 30, 18, 27, 30, 26, 31, 46, 39, 40, 42, 33. Ideally, you should put the numbers in the stem and leaf diagram in numerical order from the leaf, like 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. But obviously, in this case, it's a little bit difficult to do because I'm writing on this and I can't exactly erase anything very easily. So basically, it doesn't matter too much because we're getting an idea of the numbers. So then it would be 15, etc., etc. So you end up with a big stem and leaf diagram that looks like that. And like I said, ideally, what you would want to do is arrange the numbers so that they go numerically in the leaf. So it goes 4, 4, 5, 5, 7, 5, 7, 7, 8, 8, 9, 9, 9. So you can see that if we look at the 0 to 9 year interval, we've got zero clients in that age group. Just in case you missed it, basically what this was is a survey of the age groups of the people that do it, that actually used the health, um, used the gym in the health and fitness group. Okay, so in the 10 to 19, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. In the 20 to 29 group, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. In the 30 to 39 group, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. In the 40 to 49 group, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Uh, 50 to 59 group, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 60 to 69 group, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc., etc. So we end up with a beautiful table that looks like that, and that's quite small. So let me just uh, change it so that we're over here. No, not there, there. Okay, so let's make this a bit bigger so that you can see it, and we'll make this a bit bigger so it's easier to draw on. Okay, so let's go along. So there's your beautiful frequency table that we've made. Okay, now we need to draw a histogram. So you'll notice now they've already worked out the class intervals for us. That was quite nice of them. Okay, but not really because we actually worked it out for ourselves using our leaf and stem plot. That's what we did. We actually chose a leaf and stem, using the leaf and stem plot, we chose our intervals, which were 0 to 9, 10 to 19, etc, etc. So now let us see, we've got 10 groups here, do you agree? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So I just want to make sure how many squares I've got. I've got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. Excellent. So I can make two blocks here an interval, okay? So in other words, this year is going to be 0 to 9 up to there. There it's going to be 10 to 19 up to here. This is going to be 20 through to 29 up to here. This is 30 through to 39 up to here. This is 40 to 49 up to here. This is 50 to 59 up to here. 60 to 69 up to here. 70 to 79 up to here. 80 to 89 up to here. 90 to 99 up to here. Okay. 
Now what we do is all we have to do is fill these numbers in. And again, it goes up to 13, 17. So I'm going to choose 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Okay. And obviously you would write frequency on this side and yeah we'd go class intervals or age intervals age intervals here okay? right so the 0 to 9 is obviously 0 but 10 to 19 goes to 11 so what you would do is you'd end up drawing a line across and you would use your ruler and you would draw a line down like this then we'd go across from the 20 to 29 is 14 so we'd go up to 14 and go across and come down. And I'm really hoping I did not. So, no. Okay, so never mind. So now I've got to draw it. I was hoping I had a completed one, but obviously not. Then we're doing 30 to 39 is going to be 17. And there is a reason we do it like this, and I'll talk to you about it at the mo in the minute. Okay, so that's 30 to 39. Then 40 to 49 is 13. Okay, then 50 to 59 is 7. You see, you can see it drops quite radically. Please, guys, you guys should be using a ruler when you draw this. Obviously, my software, as you know, does not allow me to draw use a ruler or snap to grid or whatever. So, unfortunately, you guys have to look at my horrible pictures without rulers. So, that is 6, and then it's 5. Oopsie, no, wrong. Try again. And then it's 5. And then four and then zero. Okay, so then do you agree this year would be our modal class? Our modal class. The one that occurs most frequency frequently is the people between the ages of 13 and 39 have got the biggest modal, modal class. And the smallest would be if you don't count in the zeros, would be between 80 and 89. Okay, interesting, hey. Right, now that, let's talk about a frequency polygon. So what is a frequency polygon? It is sometimes used to represent the same information as histogram. So it looks like a histogram, okay, but there's a bit of an addition. This is, but what is now drawn is a line using, this is drawn, but now what's happened is they draw a frequency polygon by joining the center points of the histogram of each bar. Okay, so in other words, they take the middle of each bar and they put a light, put a point at the middle of it at the top. Okay, so this is obviously two because that's value is two. This is five, seven, ten, and four. And then they join them. And they don't join them, they actually join them with straight lines, not with a beautiful curve, okay? And that is called your frequency polygon. So the frequency polygon connects the coordinates of the center of each interval and the count of each interval. So that point there effectively would be the center. So it would be five, two. This here would be 15, Five. Do you understand? So this would be 25, 7, this would be 35, 10, and this would be 45, 4. So an example is the histogram that was developed from the last lesson. Okay, they've obviously got a much prettier one than I have. So now if we had to join, the, make, make the frequency polygon, we take the middle of each point. Okay, so from 0 to 9 is 4.5 and 0. From 10 to 19, the middle is 14.5, and this happens to be 11, I think. 24.5 and 14, 34.5 and 17, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that is your frequency polygon. So now that all you needed to know was the difference between a frequency polygon and a histogram because sometimes they'll say to you please draw a histogram and sometimes they'll ask you to please draw a frequency polygon and you need to be able to know the difference and actually do them. Okay, now we need to talk about a cumulative frequency graph and this is essential. You have to know this is very important. Um, 
Okay, so let's talk about it. What is a cumulative frequency graph? Well, that's a cumulative frequency graph, but it's also known as an O Um what or OGIVE, I don't know, depends on what your teacher said when you were at school or university or whatever, so what, how you said. Um, but the point is that it is very useful in finding things. It reflects the cumulative frequency, in other words, the running total. So words, what is it saying at the moment? It's saying if this is the length versus frequency, then it's saying the smallest number was 13.5, okay? Then it's saying that, hang on, let me see, what's this five? So this is saying one, two people had a length of, or two things had a length of 15.5. Then it says, and less, 15.5 and less. Six things had a length of 21.5 and less. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is that, 15 things had a length of 26.5 millimeters and below. So this counts up the number of things that are included in that height, length and below it, okay? It's typically S-shaped. So let's have a look at an example, okay? It says here we've got a group of learners achieved a mark out of 30, okay? So these are the marks, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 26, 26. There are the number of learners that got it. So two people got 20, three got 21, five got 22, five got 23, seven got 24, 10 got 25, 30, which is very good. That's an A. But now they want us to draw a cumulative frequency table. So again, the first thing we need to do is write down the marks and the frequency of each and then get the frequency cumulative frequency. So I don't see yeah. So we start off with writing down the marks 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. Nobody got full marks apparently. The frequency for this is two people got 23 got 21. 5 got 22, 5 got 23, 7 got 24, 10 got 25, 13 got 26, G summer said in the previous page, that's really good, 5, 4 and 2. But now what is the cumulative frequency? The cumulative frequency, well for the first one's easy, two people got 20 and below, right? But now what we're saying is that 2 plus 3 is 5, 5 people got 21 and below, okay? Then, if we add the next five, we can say, well, 10 people got 22 and below, okay? Or 15 people got 23 and below. So we end up with a, graph, with a table that looks like this, where this here is the cumulative frequency numbers, okay? And again, it's a bit small, so let me just... <gasps> can't find it. Oh, no, man, Candace. Sorry, just a second. I'm being off. Okay. Okay, there we go. Um, and now I've got from master to here. Here we go. Where is it? <laughs> Hang on a second. Let me see if I can find it now. Okay. Um, I just don't know what's going on. Okay, I'm sorry guys. Oh, there it is. There it is. But why won't it show up? Okay, never mind. We'll just press it there. I'm sorry. I don't know why, but it won't show up on the thing. Okay, so there we go. So this is the cumulative frequency. So in total, we have total of 56 people that wrote the test. Okay, that is it. And this final total should equal the number of people that wrote the test. Okay, if it doesn't, we've done something wrong. Okay, so now the way we plot this is, this is the cumulative frequency and this is the marks. So we can, doesn't have to start at zero. Let me just check what we got, we got one. Okay, so this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so you can start over here at 20. Okay, so we've got 20. 
and 29. All right. So what we're saying is that two people, and I'm putting little crosses because it's easier when every time I do a dot, it just has a nervous breakdown. So two people got 20 and below. Five people, two, four, six, six, five. Five people got 21 and below. Then we got 10 people got 22 and below. Um, 15 people, 15 people got 23 and below. And you carry on plotting it. Okay, let me show you anyway. 24 is 22. 25 is 32. 26 is 45, 45, 27 is 50. Um, I've messed up, I think. Yeah, I have. Where did I mess up? Oh, it's this one. That's okay. Um, yeah, just that one. Okay, let's go back. So 25 is in the right place. Let's go back to 26. 26 is 45. So 26 is 45. 27 is 50. 28 is 54. And 29 is 56. And now what you do is you join the dots. So you go through it as best you can. And obviously you guys have erasers. So if you mess this up, you can erase it and start again. And you end up with a graph that looks more or less as that. Okay. Now we need to determine the lower quartile. But now the way you do this is, and this is one of the few times when you ever read off from the y-axis first and not the x-axis, okay? We know that we have got 56 readings, okay? So the way you do this is Q1 is a quarter of 56 plus 1, which is 14.25. So what we're looking for is a cumulative frequency of 14.25. We're saying that out of the 56 people, we're looking for the lower quartile, which is 14.25. So obviously it lies, so therefore the lower quartile lies between the 14th and 15th learner's mark. So now we're gonna go look for that. That is 14 and that's 16, so it's 14. So let me just change color here. Yeah. So it goes between, this is 14 and this is 16, but it's closer to 14. So we go across and then we go down. We go down. And you can see that the mark is just under 23. So that would be Q1. This is Q1. Okay. Now to determine the median, what do we do? We go a half times 56 plus 1, which is 28.5. So therefore, we can say that the lower, the median lies between the 28th and 29th learner's mark. So we're going to go 28. That's 28. That's the T. So 28 is just across here. Dush, 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 dush. And then down. Dush, 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 dush. Dish, 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 dish. And that there would be, see, that's what happens when you draw a circle on this thing. So that would be Q2, your median. And then similarly, the upper quartile would be three quarters of 56 plus one, which is going to be between 42 and 43. So this is 42, that's 44, so it's closer to 43. And again, do you see why it would be nice to actually be able to use a ruler? to be able to get this Q3 value. Okay, so therefore that there is Q3. Okay, so the reason you'd want that is because then they'll say to you, please draw a box and whisker diagram um, from this. And obviously this would be, I would possibly say that that's 22,8 or 23. This is 24,75 and this is 25.75. Those would be my Q1, Q2, Q3. And obviously this value here would be your 
um, minimum and this value here would be your maximum value. So there is your five number summary from your cumulative frequency. But please note, this is one of the only times I've ever seen where you actually measure, your, you read from the, the, the dependent axis first. You read from the Y axis to get your X value. Okay, right now, just a reminder of the measures of central tendency, we've got mean, which is the average value of a set of data, median, which is the middle value of the ordered set of data, mode, which is the data value that occurs most often. Range, we've spoken about intercordial range, standard deviation, we do on the calculator, which is awesome. The five number summary, remember, is minimum, lower quartile, median, upper quartile, a maximum value, which can be represented in the box and whisker plot. If you did it in the box and whisker plot, the way it works is, excuse the spike, let me fix that. Okay. And again, you would use a ruler and you would also measure off all the values using both using a ruler as well but you'd need to use a ruler to be able to draw this properly okay this would be the minimum value this is q1 this year wherever it may be is q2 this would be q3 and this would be your maximum value right so now we need to talk about symmetrical versus skewed data so this is beautifully symmetrical and it's got nothing to do with these outliers. People always think that it's to do with these minimum max, these whiskers. Agreed, this is the box and this is the whisker and this is the whisker. And people always think that the data is symmetrical is skewed with respect to the whiskers. It's got nothing to do with that. It's got to do with this distance versus this distance. It's how far Q1 is from the median and how Q3, far Q3 is from the median. And you can see here yeah, that Q1 is two units away from the median, and Q3 is two units away from the median. So therefore, we can say this is definitely symmetrical data. Whereas, if there is way more data above the median, there's way more data between the median and Q3, then we say the data is skewed to the right because we're saying basically there's a heck of a lot more of the data lying on this side of it, okay, than on this side. Do you understand that? Whereas if it's skewed to the left, then we say that the data, there's a lot more data clustered on the left-hand side than on the right-hand side, and therefore we say that it's skewed to the left. Now, let's just talk about outliers. We've already spoken about the fact that this year is the minimum value and this is the maximum value, okay? Now, if the largest number of the data set is far removed from the bulk of the data, we call this number an outlier. An outlier will result in a long whisker. So an outlier is data that's very far away from the rest of the data. Now, if the data set looks like this, okay, where it's la 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 la, and then it's da da da, and then la 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 la, then obviously that outlier will ignore. But if they are looking at data that goes la 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 la, la then that <laughs> you'll notice that that data set follows the same trend. So it'll still be included in your box and whisker, but it's going to end up giving you a very long whisker. Do you understand that? So now let's talk about scatter plots. Scatter plots are basically a way to plot bivariate data. Now bivariate sounds like a very scary word, but all it's saying is that there's got data where you've got two variables, like an X, Y graph, okay? So if you're plotting, for example, this is, um, the observed stage, whereas this is the something else, oh, forecasted value, the forecast values. So let's say, for example, oh, this is of a comet program. So what they've done is they have um, plotted where they think the comet will appear versus where it actually appear, appeared, 
okay? So this is where they thought it would appear, this way, and this is the, where they've plotted where that actually appeared, okay? And it is giving them more or less a straight line. So that means that it's showing that there is a more or less linear relationship between where they thought the date the, the comet would um, be viewed versus where it actually was viewed, which is great because that means that their program is working quite well. It, you use it to draw a best fit line. Okay. It can also be used to identify outliers, as we've mentioned before. Now, you need to understand the correlation. If you can draw a straight line through it, more or less a straight line through it, okay, with a which has got a positive gradient, then we say that it's a positive correlation. If we can draw a straight line through it, but the straight line's got a negative gradient, then it is said to have a negative correlation. So it doesn't mean that there's no correlation if it's a negative correlation. All that they mean is that it is got it that has a negative gradient. And finding no correlation, if you can't draw a best fit line, if it looks like this, then there is no correlation between the data. Okay, now let's talk about outliers. As I mentioned before, when we take our data, okay, and this is a knee diameter versus an ankle diameter. So what they did was they measured the knee diameter and they measured the ankle diameter and then they plotted it, okay? And they saw for most things that have had a beautiful, fitted a beautiful straight line, but there were these little points here where you can see the knee diameter was way bigger than the ankle diameter for these people. Well, I mean, that would fit on the line, okay? So normally, if a person had that type of ankle diameter, they would have that much knee data and ditto, okay? So you can see that these are outliers. Now, generally what happens with outliers is outliers, is, outliers are discarded from the, from the data. Okay, now we need to talk about the least squares regression line, because remember we said we can draw a best fit line. Okay, but what I want to show you something is basically, hang on, let me go back for a second. Do you see this beautiful graph here? Now they've drawn a best fit line and the way they've done it is they probably use least squares regression where they basically are measuring the distance of all the data points on either side. Okay, up to now, the generally the way that we say to you um, draw a best fit line is we would say try and either go through as many points as possible or um, try and um, or try and make sure that your data is kind of evenly spread on either side, okay? But do you see that it's quite easy at this point if you don't know the least regression, you could have easily gone, well, actually, I think it should look more like it's going there. Or actually, it should go through. Oh, sure, but that's not, not going to work. Can let me fix this. Um, it should, actually looks to me like it should go through that dot over there. So we want it to look like that. Okay. So it's very difficult when you're just doing it by rule of thumb, when you're just sucking thumb to see where the things again actually draw the best fit line. Okay, you can definitely see it's a linear correlation, but drawing the actual best fit line can be a bit tricky. So what we use is what's called the least squares regression line. And there is a method to doing this on your calculator. Okay, so first of all, this is the line of best fit. Okay, the equation for the least square and regression line is y is equal to a plus bx. Seems pretty obvious. Where a is your y-intercept and b is your gradient, okay? Think about it. We've got a y is equal to mx plus c, right? Where m is your gradient and c is your y-cut, right? But now all they've done is they've rearranged it. So they're writing it as a plus bx. But a is you now your y-cut and b is your gradient. Please note that outliers are always excluded from the calculations. The most important thing is you have to make sure that your outliers are excluded. So let's look at calculate the least squares regression line manually. Okay, the way you would do this is you would calculate the average x value and the average y value using this formula. So you'd go all the x values, you would add them up, 
and divide by the number of x values. Then you take the y values, add them up, and divide them by the number of y values you have to get the average. Then we would calculate the gradient of the line using the formula of x minus x average, y minus y average, the sum of them, all over the sum of x minus x average squared. Okay, it's quite a tedious thing to do because what you're doing is you're going, okay, so let's say your numbers are, I don't know, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, five. Okay, so then your first number would be, this would be x minus x average, whatever it was. So that would be, for example, eraser. Hang on, that would be, for example, 1 minus whatever the 1 average is, multiplied by um, 2 minus the y average, what that was, plus, then it would be 2 minus x average times by 3 multiplied minus y average, and then you divide, and you keep going, plus, da, 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 and then you divide it by x, sorry, you divide it by 1 minus y x average squared plus 2 minus x average squared plus 3 minus x average squared all the way through. And that would just give you the gradient. <laughs> That's just the gradient, right? Then you calculate the y-intercept by substituting the average x and average y and the b into the equation y equals bx, y equals a plus bx, and you would get this formula y equals a plus bx. Okay, but there are ways to do it on your calculator, and we'll talk about that in a second. But the predictions are used in the line of best fit. The lines of best fit are useful for making predictions about the given data set. So you can do interpolation. This is when we're given x, y value of the line of best fit to make a prediction. Okay, so whereas, okay, so for example, if we've got a whole bunch of data, and let's say we get that this is the line of best fit, okay? And this is, I don't know, uh, y, we'll just call it y and x, right? And I want you to, I say to you, what happens if x is 50? Then the, what I would do is, this is interpolation, I would go, well, 50 is about over here. We don't actually have a dot there, but if I read onto this line that I've plotted and then go across, I will get the y value, and that is called interpolation. Extrapolation would be, they say, what happens if y was, or what happens if y was really big, okay? So you go, okay, fine, well, no big deal. If it's really big, what I can do is I can follow, I can extend this line up, and then I can read what x would be. Okay, that extrapolation. Extrapolation is extending the y line, the, the, the straight line, out to some point and then reading off or calculating, whereas interpolation is within the data set we already have. Right, now we need to talk about the correlation coefficient and we will start that in tomorrow's lesson. I mean, on what's today? Today's Monday, on Wednesday's lesson. Have a great day.